Hi, my name is Pastor Danny Levesque, and I'm the pastor of Bethel Assembly of God. And this is a course called the Spiritual Strategy Course for uh, principles and such from Scripture on how to what what things to be doing to develop spiritually. So whether you're a new believer or you've been following the Lord for a while, uh, it is still helpful to gain some tools to utilize to continue to grow. All of us still have a need to grow. Uh, none of us have reached the state of perfection yet, so all of us still need to grow. And in this course, we go over a number of different things that we need to understand and be doing in order to develop uh, spiritually and to continue to grow. Now, if you are a part of Bethel and you would like to become an official member, you, you don't have to become a member of Bethel to do this course. Obviously, it's online. You can, you can do the course at your own leisure for your own purposes. Uh, but if you would like to become a member, an official member of Bethel, then you must complete all 12 courses, uh, all 12 sessions. This is the, the 10th session. There's still two more yet to be recorded. Uh, but this is the 10th session. And once you've completed each session, then there is in comments the, the outline of the notes as well as a quiz to take and send back to me and get in contact with me for us to begin to evaluate your completion and your ability to become a member. Uh, if you uh, have a difficult time accessing that, just let me know. You can leave that in the comments of any of these videos or you can message me on Facebook, or you can email me at dlevck at bethelpgh.org, and I will gladly assist you in acquiring membership. So this is session 10. So uh, again, just to review, session one was what is a believer? What, what does it mean to be a believer? Session two is uh, what is the Bible? Session three is the spiritual disciplines that we need to be doing to grow. Session four is how do I interpret the Bible? Session five is uh, session five and session six cover the essential doctrines and then the important non-essential doctrines. Session seven covers the uh, the morals uh, that we need to be aware of from Scripture. Session eight covers the our ability to hear God's voice and be led by the Spirit. Session nine is how we share our faith with others, why and how. And this session is on the body of Christ, which we call the church. Uh, now, uh, what is the church? What is the body of Christ? And, and what am I supposed to be doing within that body? And how is it supposed to be functioning? All of those questions uh, are presented to us in Scripture, and that's what we want to look at in this session. So first, what is the church? Well, in scripture, and again, I'll put the outlines in the notes, uh, so you'll have the references to the, the scriptures that point this out, but the church is every believer. Every believer makes up the church. However, each individual is supposed to be involved with the other believers. So uh, there is this individuality, as well as a group dynamic that that kind of flows and makes it a, an almost an elusive concept to understand what the church is. It's if you are a follower of a G, of Jesus Christ, you are a part of the church. But we are only really the church when we're in the church, because the church isn't any individual. The church is the collective whole. And, and so me as a person, I am not the church standalone, but I am a part of the church. Uh, you can see that in 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul goes back and forth between the idea of there is one body, but we're individually members of it. But even though we're individually members and, and there you know there's not many bodies though there's still one body so there's only one church in the biblical sense there's only one church uh, and the church is the collection of the whole of the believers and we are failing to 
to exist as the church when we are not functioning together. So it's not just, well, there's a bunch of believers uh, on the planet, and so that means that those believers are the church. Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, they are, but they're not really being the church if they're not functioning together. And not just me living righteously, me seeking the Lord through prayer and Bible study and such, uh, me sharing my faith with others and fulfilling my life purpose, but it's me working with other Christians and building relationships with other Christians and collaborating with them and being challenged and held accountable by them. Uh, that is the dynamic that results in the church existing. So again, it's it's kind of, kind of an elusive concept. It, it is us, but it isn't. Uh, it is the group, but it isn't. It, it is the activity that's happening, but it's not, it's the people. So uh, that, that's kind of the, the parameters of, of what the church is. Uh, we, we are a, a collection of believers. Uh, now, a couple of things. What, what constitutes someone being a part of this church? Well, all the way back in session one, we talked about what it means to be a believer. So if I'm not the biblical definition of a believer, then I'm not actually a part of the church. You know, just because I say I believe in something doesn't make me a part of the church. I either am a part of the church or I'm not. So I have to be a, a genuine believer. But what is it that unites us, the church, together? I wanted to say, uh, as an aside note, since there's only one church, that doesn't mean there isn't a place for denominations or individual local church bodies. Uh, the reason why those are necessary is because we're supposed to gather together as believers. And sometimes when we come together as believers, we have certain beliefs and such. And, and in order to carry out a gathering, uh, sometimes certain beliefs don't jive in order for that to work in a healthy way. Now, usually when we're in a gathering of believers, particularly a local church, we don't agree with everybody in that church. And, and that's fine. We can still get together and have a gathering together. No one expects us to always agree on everything. But uh, if, say, for example, you know, one group of people believe that we should be charismatically expressing spiritual gifts in a but gathering of believers and another group believes that that's not appropriate, we shouldn't be doing that. Well, those two groups can't actually function together because their viewpoints are affecting the way we manage the, the meeting, the gathering of the believers. So there's, there's, there's uh, times in which we have to um, function in some ways separately uh, according to belief systems that affect the way we do worship services. Uh, even beyond that, leadership uh, style and those kind of things. So there's different things that make it difficult for there to be a blanket unity. Uh, and in order for us to accomplish and things and move forward and not be forever stuck in this lockdown debate over things, uh, we have to eventually splinter off uh, and, and carry out our assignments. And we still, want, we still want to be united and cooperative and we want to work on those things. But at the same time, there's, there's a reason for the existence of denominations and uh, local churches. So uh, we wrestle through those things. But, but even though there's, there's multiple denominations and multiple local churches, the church is still uh, a collection of all of those things. So if I'm a Baptist, Assembly of God, uh, Presbyterian, whatever the denominational thing is, as long as I'm a true believer in Jesus Christ, then I'm a part of this church. So all those denominations are part of the one church. All those local churches are a part of the one church. Really, the question is, is whether or not you are a legitimate believer. And I, and I, I believe that probably in all denominations and in all local churches, there's people that, that are not actually legit believers that are a part of that. So again, the heart of this is, are you right with Jesus? If you are, you're in the church, whether you're a Baptist, a Methodist, what, whatever you are, whether you're part of first church down the road or second church on the other side of the road, you're a part of the church. And, 
uh, we need to see ourselves as one cohesive body. Uh, but what, what is it that, that we unite around? Because uh, the Bible says that, that we need to pursue unity, and Jesus says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. So there is this um, need to pursue unity with one another, but united around what? What is it that holds us together as one? Because unity, just for unity's sake, doesn't always accomplish the stated goal. So if we're just being united because we want to get along with each other, well, that doesn't make us the church. If we want to just uh, unite together so that there's peace and harmony, uh, so that there's justice, uh, that might be good goals, but that doesn't make us the church. What makes us the church, and again, like I said, this is a, an elusive concept, the definition of what church is. What makes us the church is this whole realm of I am a believer, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm right with him, and as that, I'm a part of this church, but the church is all of us together, and the church is all of us not just existing, but all of us functioning together. So what is it that unites us together? What is it that we are to pursue unity over? Well, Philippians 2 gives us a good uh, good foundation for developing that, and that is in Philippians 2, verse 1 through 2, Paul says uh, that there are four qualities that, that we have as the body of Christ. One is that we have the same mind. Uh, th this is what we are to pursue, the same-mindedness. And this mind, the same mind, is that uh, we see that in the Bible, that, that the Bible is the revelation of the mind of God. We know what is true, what is God's way of thinking and approach, what's right and wrong by what the scriptures say. We've been over that in a number of the sessions that we've covered so far. So what unites us in mind is what does the Bible say? We're all submitted to the Bible. Now, we might uh, start to have differences of opinion and, and debate amongst ourselves about how to interpret a given passage and, and what the Bible is specifically saying to specific uh, happenings. Uh, but our core heart should be, we want to find the Bible's answer. So when we debate and when we work through issues, we're going to the Bible to help us find what is the right answer in this scenario. So if we, if we end up in a place where we're trying to debate about ideas, but we're doing it in the realm of philosophy and not in the realm of what does the Bible say, then we're not actually functioning as the church. We can't find unity out in the realm of philosophy. And not that there's not a place for that. It's just not the church. The church is, what does the Bible say? Secondly, uh, Paul urged them to have the same love. Now, what is our love? We know that Revelation says that uh, to one of the, the churches in those letters that you have forsaken your first love, that is your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we share this common uh, adoration for Jesus Christ, and that's a part of our unity, is that we together adore and worship Jesus Christ. We love Jesus Christ. Uh, third is united in spirit. That is, there, there needs to be this spirit of unity or this attitude of unity that when we have disagreements, when we have issues that surface, differences of opinion, uh, decisions that, that are becoming conflicting, then behind us, so we go to the scripture to get the answers. We have a dedicated heart to the Lord, but we also need to, behind us, at our, in, our, in our backing, have a, a craving to be united with this person. So I, I, it, does, it can't become like it does in the realm of politics today, where we have a difference of an agreement, a difference of a viewpoint, and you become my adversary, and I have to beat you out of power in order for, for me to get my agenda across. That's not what should happen in the body of Christ. And Jesus would often say that uh, the world leads and expresses power this way, but that's not the way it should be in the body of Christ. So when we differ then our goal is to say, you know, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're, we're on the same team, and we need to keep that in mind. So that's going to dictate how I go about 
uh, handling the conflict, uh, the differences of opinion and viewpoints and stuff. And I'm going to do everything I can to prevent a splitting from happening. Uh, and, and if I don't have biblical cause, because that's what uni unites us, then, then we're not going to split. So that, that's kind of there in the atmosphere that's, that's supposed to be present. The, the fourth and last principle he, he lifts to us in Philippians 2 is that we are to be intent on one purpose. Uh, and the purpose, uh, the mission of the church is to spread the gospel, to advance the kingdom of God. And, and that needs to be at the heart of what we want to be doing. So we're debating biblical matters and, and realm of thought. We're letting our devotion to Christ guide us and our devotion to each other guide us. Uh, but in the end, where our major work is, is pushing each other and challenging each other and figuring out how we advance the kingdom of God. It's, this is, again, not a philosophical, uh, I don't know, vacuum or space. That, that's not, even though it, it is phil philosophical in a sense, uh, it's not a place where we just debate philosophical issues. So the, the, the goal is for us to, to know the truth and make it known to the whole world and get other people a part of this kingdom. That that is what should be at the center of what we are working through as the body of Christ. So that leads me to a question, and that is, who has the authority in the church? What people are, are in charge of the church? Uh, we see throughout Scripture an expression that there is some kind of authority structure that is in the church. Uh, we see the way the apostles carried certain authority. We see the way that there were elders and overseers. There's different terms that are used, even though we don't have full clarity on how those, the people in those offices were functioning. There was something there uh, as far as authority is concerned. You have the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. Uh, so you just have, have uh, an expression of authority within the church. Even though to some, ex to some extent, there, there is authority that every believer has. And really what, what it boils down to is accountability. How are we holding each other accountable to the things that the church is supposed to be? Uh, how are we doing that? Who is doing the, the uh, holding to accountability? When you think through Matthew 18 and Jesus' instruction was, if someone sins against you, you go and show them his fault in private. Uh, and then if it works out great, if it doesn't, then you move to another level of getting two or three witnesses with you. And if it doesn't work out, then you move on to tell it to the whole church. Now, what the whole church is, is, is kind of a lingering question there also. Uh, but there, there are, the, again, it's accountability. So any Christian can attempt to hold another Christian accountable to, to uh, scripture and to their walk with the Lord. Uh, but not every Christian is in the same space as far as maturity is concerned. Uh, so their character quality and whether or not they're, they're trustworthy in their character and in their intentions, their, their, uh, the revelation that they have, how much do they understand, truly understand the scripture and how able are they to convey the truths of scripture? And it's why in Titus and in Timothy, which is really the predominant space where we're given details of what the qualifications of people who are in leadership in the church are, it's predominantly about character. What kind of character do they have? And also it's about their ability to, to preach the word, to communicate the truth. And so these things have to be there and not everybody's in the same space. It's not that everybody can't be there. It's just that not everybody's in the same space. So person A might not really deserve to have the same amount of leverage as person B does. And this is where you kind of get shifts in where you have uh, some authority within the church. Now, figuring out... <laughs> who has the authority, how much they have, what they do with that authority. Uh, that is where the challenge is. And, and there are different viewpoints all over the place, uh, different viewpoints. But uh, 
but the Bible isn't really clear uh, as far as the right posture to take. You have your more hierarchical structures where you have, like in the Catholic Church, where you have the priest is in charge of that parish, and yet there's a, a bishop, archbishop, cardinal, all the way up to the pope outside of that local parish that has the authority over that priest and, and all the way up to, like I said, to the pope. Where you have your more congregational type styles where the church members vote on different things and it's more like a democracy the group uh, leads that church and makes those decisions then you have uh, an in-between state which a lot of churches sit in this spot where the pastor has a certain measure of authority and then there is a board and and sometimes people will call them deacons sometimes elders sometimes just board uh, or board members, and, and that body has some authority, and, and sometimes you even, you know, have the membership ha ha has a certain level of authority, and, and sometimes this happens more in that, you know, in the American church, we kind of play it out this way, uh, almost mimicking the, the federal government, where we have a, a president, and we have a Congress, and a judicial branch, and we have a voting population, and so you kind of have this balancing out of power that's happening, and sometimes that happens within a church. Uh, again, there's this somewhat of a shared, but a tiered, you know, one group or person has more power than the others, but there's a little bit of a restraint amongst the other groups. So getting up pastor, sometimes staff, board, membership of the church, sometimes there's still some outside influence. So you got those things kind of swirling together. Sometimes things get lopsided and whether or not that's appropriate or not is the question. Sometimes you have uh, where the pastor is really, you know, just in charge. The, the board doesn't say get to have a say. The members, it's just the pastor, whatever he says goes. Uh, sometimes it's like that in practice, but not on paper. Sometimes it's like that on paper also. Sometimes the board is the one that's really carrying the power and the pastor just kind of has to go through the board with everything or through the membership. So there's all different ways of expressing that. But the bottom line is it's difficult to, to get momentum and to move and make decisions and to hold people accountable if there's no authority somewhere. So that's something that each local body has to work out to try to figure out what's the best expression of that. And it's important that we uh, work towards being submissive. There, there's a balance. And again, back to 1 Corinthians 12, we got the individual and the group. There's a balance tension between uh, I have to be accountable before God. So no matter what the group did, if it was wrong and I participated in that wrong, then I'm wrong before God myself. I can't say, well, the group did it. That's why I did it. So I still have to have a clear conscience individually before God. I have to go to the scripture and it's not me making choices. It's me honestly, sincerely going to the scripture and going to God and, and listening to Christian counsel and taking all that into consideration and trying to discern God's voice and then from that, going with whatever uh, my conscience, the Holy Spirit speaking through my conscience is saying to me. Uh, but I want to be hesitant, though, that if the group is, is on a different, in a different place, they, they're coming to a different conclusion uh, than I am, that, then I don't want to just uh, discount that. I, I want to ask myself, what's going on? Because all these other Christians are saying it's this way. And so I want to be cautious in proceeding in a different direction. I can, and ultimately, again, I have to work those things out, uh, and yet I need to be very cautious in doing that. But at the same time, I can't just go with the group, whatever the group says. I still want to be trying to do this discernment thing to discern things. Uh, but in the end, I want unity, so I want to work in that direction. Uh, plus the, the body, it's, so that's something that's happening on the individual side. Uh, on the organizational side, the organization has to uphold uh, the standards of what it is to be the body of Christ. And if some individual is not complying to that direction, uh, then they have a tension of trying to decide you know, I don't want to just put an individual out just for any reason, but the Bible does give us instructions like in Matthew 18, 
if if you bring it to the whole church and there's still a problem, you put them out of the church. And we see that in 1 Corinthians, either chapter five or six, I think it's chapter five, where Paul tells them there's this guy, there's this issue, and they need to put him outside of the church. So the church still needs to do that, but they should still be restrained for that practice to say, I don't want to put someone out just for any reason. I want to make sure that, that, that they are truly in violation of, of something that's worthy of that. And then you push them push them out. And the church needs to be hesitant with that. But at the same time, they have a responsibility to uphold certain standards. Uh, and, and so the group has to respect the individual and making their choices, but the individual has to re respect the group and making their choices. So it might end up being the individual decides, I'm not, I can't be a part of this group because it's violating my conscience. I'm going to have to go to another group, but it, I got to do that very hesitantly. And then the organization or the group has to say, you know, I, I can't violate, we can't violate our collective conscience here. So we can't allow this person to stay because they're violating that but we want to move them out very hesitantly. And, and so that's, that's kind of the tension that we sit in. And I think what happens is people kind of err on one side or the other, uh, and we miss a, a, an accountability dynamic that needs to exist among us. So that, that's kind of a, a challenging point there. Uh, so um, as to Bethel, uh, we, we uh, we'll get into that in our last two sessions on specifically how does Bethel function. So now, uh, how do we examine whether or not a group is Christian or not? So there's a group I'm thinking about being a part of, or there's a group that that I'm not a part of, but there's some kind of engagement between me and that group, or considered engagement between me and that group. Uh, in the Scripture, we're we're supposed to, when it comes to someone who is a false teacher there is supposed to be some kind of separation that happens, sometimes to the extent that I don't even associate with them. So we want to try to figure out how do I abide by that, yet at the same time, uh, not everything enters into that category. So what makes it to where there's a group of people that as far as church activity, whether it's inside the local church or broader than that, uh, can I do I need to refrain from because this group is of a certain nature. Uh, so how do we examine that? Well, well, first there's again, a scriptural admonition that uh, we need to make sure we're evaluating ourselves. And there's even admonition to uh, evaluate others. And I think sometimes in our American culture, we're very uh, a fearful or leery of, of evaluating another person, but that's not a biblical mindset. The biblical mindset is we need to evaluate people to determine how I need to approach them spiritually, the kind of union I have with them, uh, whether or not this person could be an influence in my life, they can become a leader and be in certain roles. So there's reasons why we have to ask those questions. It's not that we're deciding that the person is or isn't saved. Uh, we're, we're coming up with an assessment of that, but we know that at the judgment seat, God gets to decide that. However, for us to function with certain realities, we have to make a judgment call. Uh, to know how we're supposed to interact with those people. Now, what is it in the Bible that makes someone be like a, a, a cult group or a non-Christian group, even if they claim to be Christian? The two primary issues have to do with doctrine and morality. Again, the outline will be uh, in the comments, uh, you can you can look up the references we'll make available for these two points, but those are the two predominant things that surface in scripture that makes us have to reject a group, is they're rejecting essential doctrine. Now, again, sessions five and six would deal with that uh, if you haven't watched them already, but essential doctrines are beliefs and practices and such that... Uh, the Bible clearly takes a, a viewpoint on, a position on. If the Bible isn't clear on it, then that's what makes it a more de debatable category. But if the Bible is abundantly clear that this is the way that it is, uh, and a group is rejecting that idea, then that puts them across a line, uh, even if they're claiming the name of Christ. 
An example of that would be the Bible is, is clear that Jesus is God, and yet Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that he's not the true God. They might make him out to be like an, an angel or a demigod, like a subpar God, but they don't believe that he's the Lord God Almighty, and they're rejecting a clear uh, doctrine in Scripture. Uh, another example of that would be the opposite issue, and that is uh, that Jesus took on human flesh. The Christian scientists don't, do not believe that Jesus took on human flesh, uh, and so they're rejecting. In fact, that one specifically is mentioned by John in one of his epistles, that if people say that, that they reject Jesus coming in the flesh, we need to consider them a curse. So uh, they are, they are uh, outside of what the body of Christ is if they're uh, rejecting essential doctrines. And I think we've talked about that in one of the sessions. There's a difference between being ignorant and not knowing versus rejecting. Uh, so these two groups, and there's other groups, but these are two examples of groups that are rejecting some essential doctrine. The second issue that surfaces is rejection of morality. Either the person themselves are practicing uh, immoral behavior, and that could be sexual immorality or idolatry, anything that's going against the, the morals of Scripture. Uh, in their lifestyle, they're doing it, or they are approving of other people living that way. Uh, that puts me in a space where I am outside the body of Christ. So if, for example, where the Bible is, and this is where, see if I get in trouble if you watch this video and hear this comment or not, uh, we dealt with this in session seven on morality. The Bible is pretty clear that homosexuality is sin. And yet there are religious groups that claim the name of Jesus that, that uh, are okay and feel that homosexuality is a godly lifestyle, sometimes within certain parameters, but we'll say that it is a, a, an acceptable lifestyle to God. Well, that is um, teaching against the morality of the Bible. And the, and the Bible says when someone does that, they're now, whether they're doing it themselves or teaching others to do it, they're outside of what the true Christian church is. So those are two things that, that determine that. It's not whether or not they agree with me on some non-essential issue. It's not whether or not they sin themselves and ever struggle with sin. It's whether they are living a lifestyle of sin and believe it's okay or teaching others that certain lifestyles of sin is okay. So the, those are the two predominant tests on whether or not a group falls outside the line. Now, some groups might be borderline uh, where they're just slightly off. Uh, it's not something that's an essential doctrine. They're accepting the essential doctrines and the morality of scripture, but there's things that are showing that they aren't really using scripture appropriately, or they're not really listening to God appropriately, that, you know, they're put, kind of putting personal visions and revelations ahead of scripture, uh, or they're teaching things that are just not jiving with scripture, even though it's not crossing the line of some essential doctrine, but they're teaching things or believing things or expressing things or living in ways that are not really driving with scripture, then it, it, caused them in, it calls them into question on where their maturity is, where their uh, loyalty is as far as to, to scripture and to Christ, uh, and it makes there be some question marks. Now, in that case, I don't, you don't consider them outside the church. In that case, because they haven't crossed those lines, in that case, you don't refuse to work with them necessarily. Uh, but there is a caution in which maybe you don't allow them to teach. Uh, because again, there's a high level of, of standard for something like that. Uh, maybe you don't allow them to be in positions of leadership or influence. Maybe you're careful how they influence your life. So there is some guarding there, but not an all-out separation like for those who are outside of the church. So, so there's two different realms there, and there's a different thing I need to do in each of those uh, scenarios. I hope that makes sense. Uh, if not, feel free to leave a comment, a question. I'd be glad to, to answer those. Um, now, just a side note, and it'll be in the outline, there, there is a call for us to be separate from the world. Uh, 
but the separation from the world is is again really that whole unequally yoked thing that that uh, unbelievers I'm I'm supposed to be careful what kind of influence they have in my life, but it obviously does not mean I have no contact with them. Otherwise, I can't I can't spread the gospel. So that there's some kind of a balancing within this whole dynamic. Uh, now, what, what is the responsibility of the church? What is the church supposed to be doing, particularly as an organization? Uh, we're supposed to be worshiping God. That, that, that's a constant presence uh, throughout the New Testament church that collectively we worship God together. Uh, that can include singing, but it, it is broader than that. And again, your outline will show you more, more details to that. Uh, secondly, we need to be pursuing unity among ourselves. We need to be working towards uh, being reconciled to one another. And again, it, that's a concept is throughout the New Testament. Uh, thirdly, we need to be about evangelism, spreading the gospel, and, and uh, also about making disciples uh, is a part of that. Then there's the need to provide support to one another. Uh, and there's the need to spread righteousness, to, to encourage, uh, admonish, and hold accountable towards uh, us becoming righteous and, and making our society more righteous. So these are the, the, the activities that should be happening, that should be pursued by the church. Now, understand that no church is perfect. So just because a church is struggling or being negligent in some of these areas doesn't mean you don't stay in that church. Uh, you just need to understand that sometimes there's different reasons why that's happening. And, and sometimes it's just a part of what we are. No individual is perfect yet. And, and since the church is made up of collective individuals, no, no local church, no denomination, uh, and the church as a whole even is not uh, where it should be. And until Jesus returns, it, it won't be. Uh, we need to work towards that, but it's not going to be in that place until Jesus returns. And so we need to have some measure of grace uh, in that, even though we know what the ideal is, we're pursuing it, but we need to be gracious towards each other and towards those in leadership that, okay, so we're not there, but that's kind of a part of this journey is we're not there, we're working on it. Um, a lot of people like to talk a, a lot about what did the early church do? particularly in the book of Acts. Uh, and I have a reflection of a number of things that they did that will be in the outline. I'll just mention them. Uh, they were united in, in thought and heart, uh, although at times there were disagreements and separations. Uh, they studied the scriptures together. They defended the faith through apologetics. They debated with non-believers to defend the gospel. They debated among themselves to sort out issues. Uh, so debate is not a bad thing. That is, that is an activity that happened in the first century uh, Book of Acts church. Uh, there was individual confrontation. That is, they confronted actions of error and beliefs of error. They confessed to one another. They would come together to burn sinful materials even. Uh, the mission was to share Christ throughout the entire world. Some had ministries that had to be dedicated to teaching and preaching and not disrupted by administrative or service-oriented ministries. Uh, they organized the ministry of helps that consisted of believers carrying out the task. Uh, the believers cooperated with each other to give their possessions to meet the needs of others. They also prayed uh, for those that were being persecuted. These were some of the activities that were happening in the book of Acts Church. Now, in the, in the uh, beyond that, there are some people that like to study the early church fathers uh, that saw, followed the first century church the next couple of centuries. There is some value to that, but again, scripture needs to come first. Sometimes these early church fathers and their activities help us to elaborate uh, on our interpretation of scripture, but we still want to be cautious there because there were there were false uh, teachings and cults that were surfacing even at that time. So we wanna make sure we're navigating through there correctly. Uh, description of their meetings. So what, what did they do when they were together? Excuse me. They united, uh, they did united group prayer. So they came together and prayed as a group. Uh, the, the word of God was being taught to address Christian living issues and such. Uh, they had fellowship, so they were 
hanging out and building relationships with each other. They were eating food with each other, along with communion being a part of that, the observance of communion. They were worshiping together. Uh, they were reporting on what was taking place in their evangelistic efforts outside of the meeting. Uh, and they were seeking God for strength to evangelize, and everyone went out and did so. So again, this was uh, this gathering of believers was like, uh, let's strengthen each other. Let's make sure we're all in a good place, and let's then uh, strategize. Let's pray for and then strategize on how we can go out and continue to carry out this mission on our own or as a group outside of this gathering. And then we'll come back together again and do it all over again. So this was the kind of cycle that was taking place in the gatherings of the early. Uh, Christians. And, and these gatherings, they took place uh, on a daily basis. Uh, it wasn't just once a week. They were consistently being together. Uh, and we, we kind of uh, lose out on that today. Uh, we should try to move back towards that. Uh, there is a sense that sometimes these, these gatherings did present some evangelistic possibilities. We see it in the gathering of the believers on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. Uh, there were conversions that took place as a result of that gathering. We see Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians, I want to say 14, where they discuss uh, the gift of tongues and interpretation and how there's a need for interpretation because if an unbeliever comes in, they won't understand. Uh, so there is this expectation, uh, even in the first century church, that unbelievers would somehow make their way in the midst there uh, as far as what was taking place. Uh, as far as their evangelistic efforts, they did it spontaneously as well as intentionally. So it was you know, some people think that it should always be spontaneous, and some people think it should always be organized. It, it, both of those things took place in the first century church. Again, they were making efforts to disciple. They were dealing with how to overcome persecution. But we talked about authority. Uh, so those are different things about the, the makeup of the church. So we covered this in a session three on, on spiritual disciplines, that we are supposed to be a part of the church involved in the church. And what that means uh, is going to vary from person to person, but you cannot truly be fulfilling the mission that uh, Jesus has assigned to you if you're not in the church working with other believers. And whether that means you're a part of a non-denominational church or a denominational church, uh, whether that means you're just involved in a local church or you're involved in, in um, multiple churches, you know, kind of a joint association, or you're involved in a denomination beyond your local church uh, might vary from person to person, but it should be our desire. And this is a struggle for even for ministers, I think. It should be our desire to work within the church and work with other believers and do everything we can to maintain unity between us and them, to respect uh, the, those in authority and respect those that are uh, leading and respect other Christians as well and their viewpoints, attempt to be held accountable uh, while trying to remain faithful to the Lord and attempt to do everything we can to influence the church in that direction. Our local church that we're a part of, and to not just bail when there's imperfections. There's so many people that, that say that they left the church and won't go back to churches because there were people in there that hurt them and those kind of things. And uh, that's always perplexing to me because you know, the, the only way you can have a perfect group of people is if everybody in the group is perfect, and that's never, never going to be the place. So, so we would never be involved in these groups if we were waiting for perfection. So uh, go into a church, be a part of a local church, and, and give grace where you can. And if, if there is a, a spot where, you know, you just would have to violate your conscience, and I mean your conscience, not just your feelings, uh, but your conscience, you'd have to truly violate, and I mean your biblical conscience, not your just your opinions. Uh, you truly would have to violate a biblical conscience to stay, unless that's what surfaces, uh, or, you know, you might, there might be relocation issues and other things, but uh, unless you have to violate your biblical conscience before the Lord, uh, 
then typically you shouldn't leave that local church. You should stay and, and not just expect the pastor to lead the church to where it should be, but you need to be a part of trying to influence that local church in that direction. All the other Christians in your life, whether they, could they go to another church or not in that direction, not to your church necessarily, but they're uh, pursuing those same goals and that you're involved in your denomination. If you're a part of a denominational church, you're involved in your denomination beyond the local church level and you're trying to push in that direction as well. And uh, just you're a, you become a force, a tool for God to push the entire church in the right direction. That should be the, the flow of what we're pursuing. That's what the body of Christ is. So if, if, I, if I perceive the church to be a building that I go to or an organization that I'm a part of, or just that I am the church because I'm a believer, then I'm missing the total picture. And so I hope that clears, clears out how we need to view and approach church. And if you have any questions, on that, feel free to leave those in the comments. I'll be glad to respond to any questions you have. Uh, but that's session 10. So we have two more sessions to record. And then the, once we do that, the whole series will be up on the uh, YouTube channel and on the Facebook page. So thank you for being a part of the Spiritual Strategy course.